We're going to take a look at the importance of entry in creating a garden room right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out and design, how to create beautiful outdoor living spaces. Now today's show, we're going to focus on the design principle entry. It's so important. You know, it's often the first impression someone has of your garden. And it's at that point they're invited to come in. An entry point is a point of transition and it creates an allure, so there's a certain sense of mystery about it. In today's show, I'd like to show you how I use herbs at my kitchen door. And speaking of doors, wait till you see what this artist has done to the front door of the garden home retreat. And if you love onions like I do, I've got a segment you're gonna love. But first, I wanna show you a project I'm working on that involves a very special entry gate. Come on. You know, we've always got construction projects going on out here at the Garden Home Retreat. And this is a little pet project of mine. It's for bantams. It's the little bantam house. And we're going to put a fence around to hold the little bantams. More importantly, the fence goes around to keep predators from getting the little bantams. But anyway, we wanted to do it all in the Greek Revival style. So that's why we have the Greek top. Looks like a little miniature version of the Parthenon sitting on the Acropolis there. And what I'm going to do is use this Greek Revival motif gate, which I'm just puttying the little holes made from nails all along here so we can get it ready for painting. We're going to place two posts out here and hang the gate on those posts. Now, the way this is going to work, I really don't want this standing out. So I'm going to, uh, we'll just take a look at this planned view of it. You see, I'm going to be bringing a fence just inside a holly hedge. The holly hedge that I'm going to use is the same holly hedge we've used throughout the entire retreat. It's needlepoint holly, and it's a great plant for shearing. We shear it twice a year, and it takes a really great form, and I love its dark color. So what you'll have is the little chicken house in the middle, You'll have a complete fence all the way around, which will keep the predators out and the bantams in. And then just on the outside, we'll have this needlepoint holly hedge with the gate on center here. And I've been working on the lawn, fertilizing it just a little bit to get it nice and green. So when we turn the little bantams loose, they'll have plenty of this green fodder to enjoy. Now I try to build things that are gonna last. And so here we used Eastern red cedar because it's a very long lasting wood not only for the gate, but for the chicken house above. And below we used cypress, uh, which is another long lasting wood. And of course I'm filling in all these little nail holes so that once it's painted, that will also make it last longer. Now one last thing I wanna say about this is that I'm getting a little solar panel that will be attached inside and it'll allow me to run a little electric wire all around the outside edge of the fence. So if any little predators come up like a raccoon or a possum or a skunk or a fox, their little wet nose will touch that and it'll give them a shock. You see, I've used a similar setup with our mobile pastured chicken operation and it's worked out very well. <music> Let's take a look at an important entry at the front of the house. It's the front door. David Zollner is actually applying a faux finish. So let's see how he's coming along. Hey, David. Well, it looks like you've already gotten started on it. Alan, nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Good grief, this thing has changed. I mean, just yesterday it was 
white, I guess, with just a primer on it. We've got the door prepped already for a finish that we're going to put on, a traditional wood graining finish, and it's going to be a wood species called Cuban mahogany. Well, I remember looking at some of those photographs in the book you have, and that Cuban mahogany is incredibly rich. It is. It's one of the most beautiful woods that we can acquire. You're going to have to convince me how we're going to get to Cuban mahogany with this color. No problem. <laughs> We have a traditional wood door here, a nice thick stock door. The key is to get the priming coats and the finishing of the, the hand rubbed finishes down to a T. We have two coats of a light terracotta paint, an oil based paint in particular. That's very good for sanding. So we finish that very smooth. We also have beautiful panels, so we have to be careful of the panels that we don't char the edges. What you've done here with the panel, uh, it looks like you've rubbed wood ash or something on it. Well, it looks that way. After we painted the two coats of terracotta color, it's very important to get the background pores of the wood with a technique called flogging. We just use a long hair brush, and we use straight pigment with a little bit of beer and some binder. An really? old, ancient, traditional finish. <laughs> You just uh, brush that out and uh, you run a long bristle uh, flogger through there and you get that technique. Let me see if I understand. You're saying that by doing the flogging, you're filling in the grain and bringing it out of, of what the original wood is. In this case, we're dealing with Spanish cedar and that will help give the Cuban mahogany a more authentic look. You know, the, the Spanish cedar has a similar grain to mahogany. Oh, really? So it's actually been uh, beneficial for us to put the flogging on, and it's actually gone down into those little pores. Yeah, very good. Tell me some of the, uh, I guess, the other techniques that you'll apply as you, as you work, you're finished with the flogging of that particular panel, so you'll flog the other panels, and then what happens after that? After that, we will take some translucent oil-based glazes. So we add different colors to that to give us a translucent layer on top of this. Just like highly polished wood you see in really fine woods. That's exactly right. Yeah. We'll take and put two to three different layers on here and we'll manipulate that with little brushes and tools. So David, since this is gonna be facing the elements on one side, what, what do we do to protect the door? Now the door must be protected from the elements, especially in the situation, the direction in which this door is facing, which would be west. So we have to protect it with nice varnishes with a lot of ultraviolet absorbers in there. And it must be maintained on a yearly basis. Okay, well I'm gonna have to get all that information from you to take care of it. I'll make sure you have it. <laughs> well I can't wait to see it in place on the front porch. It's gonna be a really beautiful addition. It is, and I can't wait to get started. Well thanks for helping us out. You're welcome. You know, most houses have multiple entries into the home and this one is no exception. And I have to say that this particular entry is the one I use the most. It goes right into the kitchen. And since I love to cook, it just makes sense to bring some of my favorite herbs that I cook with closer to the kitchen. So what I've done here is I've gotten a little carried away, but I wanna make a point. You can grow wonderful, fresh herbs just outside your door in containers like this. And hey, they don't look half bad coming up the staircase. We start at the bottom with parsley. We move up to this container that has red cabbage. Yes, red cabbage. Look at those gorgeous leaves with those red veins with some cilantro. Then we have here some Italian flat leaf parsley, more curly parsley. I seem to be on a parsley kick these days chives at the top just about to come into bloom and then yes another parsley of course i could have rosemary and thyme out here and i do have some of those down in the little greenhouse area but i brought these up because these are all cool weather herbs so early in the spring you can bring these out and begin using them in the kitchen and just enjoying the flavor of them i just love to sit out here and taste them there's something wonderful about fresh parsley so if you think you don't have a lot of time to garden or you don't have a lot of space, think about just outside your back door using some containers and filling them with various types of herbs. It can be very beautiful and I think very tasty. And one thing you need to know for all of these that we've talked about in this lineup, you need full sun. We're facing the south here so we get plenty of light and as you can see they're thriving. <music> Mm -hmm. 
Now, different people plant onions in different ways, but I'm going to show you how I plant onions. In the spring, when the leaves start coming out on the trees and it's still pretty cool, I like to create a long bed like this that's about 30 inches wide, and I throw the ground up about four to five inches, and it's good and loose. You can see what I've done here with this. Really good soil. And um, I'll use a all-purpose organic fertilizer in here, about a 4-4-4. Four, four, four. And then I take onion sets. They come in bundles like this. They look dry and doesn't look like they've got much promise, but as soon as they make soil contact, you're going to have something really coming on that's going to taste good later on. These little uh, basil plates here where the roots are, when they make contact, what I like to do is just push them in the ground just about three quarters of an inch, and I space them about four inches apart, just like this, you see. And I line them up. And this is a little sweet yellow onion. And what's great about these is that I can come out here and I can harvest them, can thin them out, and eat them as green onions through the growing season. And as summer comes along, I'll keep pulling the soil away from them. And that'll cause a big bulb to form, like we see in the grocery store. And then they're harvested and they're hung in the barn, or a place where they won't freeze, they stay dry and cool, and they'll last all year long and then we start the process all over. But it's amazing what can come from just a bundle of these. There's about a hundred plants that come in a bundle. They'll go a long way, and I'm gonna plant about 500 onions down through here, so we'll have plenty to eat all through the seasons. <music> Just look at all of these gorgeous buds on this old rose, and not a single aphid, because I make sure we have plenty of ladybugs around. But this rose is one called Penelope, and I love its very soft apricot color. It comes from the 1930s, as well as Sarah Van Fleet. You can see her back there, and she's come along quite a bit in the last week, even though it's been rather cold. I love roses of all kinds. We have very early roses here. We have one called Old Blush, which dates back to the 1790s. Many of the Noisette roses from the first quarter of the 19th century. And then these from the mid 20th century. And, and then lots of modern roses. I think climbing roses are a good way to spice up an entrance. In my city garden, I have roses accentuating entryways to the different garden rooms. On this arbor, which brings visitors into the Rondell Garden, I've grown a pink rose called New Dawn, also from the 1930s, which I chose for maximum bloom potential and minimal maintenance. They really set the mood and style for what you see in my garden home. Another low maintenance rose I love is the Noisette rose called Lamarck, which frames the door to my tool shed. Lamarck has double white petals with just a slight touch of yellow at the base, and it's such an exuberant grower. Here its blooms provide a good contrast against the color of the tool shed as they draw your eyes in. Over here I've punctuated this entryway to the fountain garden with the white American beauty, or sometimes called Frau Karl Drewski. It was introduced in 1901. While not technically an old-fashioned rose, its big beautiful blooms add elegance to the garden, and for this reason it's remained popular in horticulture for many years. What I love the most about roses and why I chose them in my garden design is evident right here. The beauty they bring can make dramatic statements in the landscape. You know, lots of people consider the rose their favorite flower. Bob Byers of Garvin Woodland Gardens is a fellow rose enthusiast and he has a colossal rose project underway. Most of our gardens here are naturalistic. We like the fact that this is a more formal garden, which is going to be a new design idiom that we can illustrate to folks. It's a major garden design aesthetic that we've not done here before, and we're really excited to be able to show people this type of a garden. Some of the footage that you're watching is from earlier in this process when we were still laying footings. As you can see now, we've gotten most of our walls poured. We're in the process of covering all this with beautiful native stone veneer. 
when this garden's finished, you will see very little besides plants, mulch, pathways, native stone, and some really beautiful wooden arbors. One of the most exciting things about this new garden is that it will have a lot of sunlight, which is something as a woodland garden we don't enjoy a lot of, and that will allow us to grow a lot of plants we've wanted to put in for a lot of years. Things like crab apples uh, that are great additions to traditional terraced gardens like this. Of course, there'll be roses, lots of roses, uh, old garden roses, and there's a significant link back to Mrs. Garvin. She had for many years here her own rose garden and it was entirely old garden varieties for the most part. Uh, and we're trying to look at her list and recreate this garden based on the plants that she originally planted here and left herself. Uh, we're really excited about all the classes of old garden roses that we'll be able to show. We'll have hybrid perpetuals, we'll have some of the old-fashioned climbers, shrub roses, a lot of the old garden classes which are not seen a lot anymore today and that, that's too bad because they're much hardier, uh, take much better care of themselves and the neatest thing is all the unusual flower forms and the really great fragrances. This is going to be a great new garden destination. There'll be all kinds of things that we love about the garden at large here, the water, the trees, the flowers, and in particular the roses, which are a great, great garden plant that everybody loves. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Well, one manufacturing plant has been doing their part to contribute to a greener environment. Denise Coogan tells us more about this ecologically minded facility. Now tell me about what's going on here. Everything that you guys throw out doesn't really get thrown out at all. It's, it's recycled, it's isn't it? Recycled or reused in some way, yes. Really? So the plastics that we see here, these will be put into like uh, buckets, grocery sacks, uh, kind of a second use of plastic for Sure, that. and what percentage of, of the, all of the stuff that I see here from this plant ends up being recycled? We actually recycle over 99% of everything we generate. 99%? So nine, it's either reused or recycled in some way. I don't mm -hmm. think I at home recycle that well. <laughs> I don't think I recycle that well either, but uh, I try. <laughs> very I'm efficient. Well, what are these? These are old bumpers and uh, plastic parts from the car that didn't make the grade. They were either scratched in some way or just uh, didn't make the quality. A slight, a slight imperfection. So instead of throwing them away, we take these and re recycle them. And they actually, this is a very high grade plastic, so it will get recycled back into car parts. Reuse means that it'll go back and it'll be used for its uh, for its original state. Intended in, purpose. For its intended purpose. Okay. Recycled, I see. it'll be put in, made into something else. Yeah, I mean, but these, it looks we like sent, it's built like a battleship. It is. These are uh, these, that's what they look like before. And then we break them down into this. These we actually saved 1.3 million dollars last year sending these parts back and packaging material. So over five million dollars worth, of, uh, five million pounds of packaging material was sent back last year. Really? Yeah. That much? So, well, you know, when you think about the volume that you guys <laughs> use here, I mean, like saving just mm -hmm. ordinary plastic mm -hmm. like this, I mean, that adds up over it the does. course of a year, doesn't millions it? Millions of pounds, literally yeah. millions of pounds. About plastic, just this plastic sheeting, I believe it's like 112,000 pounds a year of, of plastic sheeting. <laughs> I just so can't, it's, I it's can't amazing. get my, I can't even it's, get my head around what that, what is this? This is actually a piece of uh, plastic board that they make They'll use this plastic, these plastic oh, I pieces. I see the wood see. grain and, on yeah, it. Yeah, and it's just for like uh, decking for patios and things like that. So yeah. they actually take our plastic and recycle it back into these kind of things. So <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of so cool. So the end product, it could end up on your deck. You never know where it might be. <laughs> what about, what about this, this stuff? This is all the plastic banding, you know, that you see that comes around all your, you know, boxes right, that you get in the mail right. and this kind of stuff. Comes in, we take it, recycle it back, gets recycled into buckets, um, just low grade plastic Fantastic. type things. Yeah. That's are these like car parts? These are or car what? parts. These are these are coming off the transmissions. They're caps while it's being shipped um, from see. Japan. What is this? This Those, looks like potting soil. <laughs> it does look like potting, <laughs> plastic potting soil. It does. But that get, actually gets sent back and uh, ground back down and made in, like, go back into bumpers, being made into bumpers. So the grindings this, from the bumpers. Oh, so when they like smooth out they the smooth bumpers. Out all the, uh -huh. And this is this you is even sweep so the floor. We, we sweep the floor and send it. We, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> our floor sweepings even get that sent back. That is too good. So, yeah. Well, it's got to make you feel good about being a part of an organization that's really trying to reuse, 
recycle every possible thing. It does. It's such an incredible experience to be able to work here and to get the, to the resources that we need to be able to do it because not every company will give you that, you know. So we're so fortunate here to have upper now, management support. Now, with, with this big emphasis here, and you're here every day, mm -hmm. has this impacted the way you think about the things you use at home? Has it made you a better recycler? It, it has, and a better consumer. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll think before I buy something, you know, what can I do with that when I get done with it? What's the end of the yeah. life of that? Or how was it made? How was it made, right. Yeah. Exactly. Very yeah. good. Well, I think we all make choices every day, and so mm -hmm. I don't think, I know we all make mm -hmm. choices, and so just thinking about how it's made, where it's come from, and what you can do with it can really impact the planet. It really can. It's amazing. If you, if you just count up the amount of material you use every year, it adds up in a, in a big way at the end of the year. Well, thanks for the time. This has been oh, well, fascinating, thank you. Thank Denise. Thank you for everything. Thanks for coming. This is the time in the show where we turn our focus to you, the viewer, and specifically some of your landscape issues. You send photographs in to me, we put them up, analyze them, and hopefully come up with some improvements. Today we're looking at a garden in Kansas. Barbara has several requests here. She loves roses, uh, they want a slightly formal garden, and I think I've got an answer for her here. What I'd like to see happen is, and she said they were gonna do this, bring a walkway all the way out to the street and it should match the brick you have here on the house to the walk. And then I would bring a walk over here to the side and one over here, all right? And then in front of it, I would plant a boxwood hedge all the way across here and all the way across here. That boxwood hedge would grow to about four feet. I would punctuate it on each side with boxwood and probably do the same thing up here. Keep the palette very simple. Then along here, add some boxwoods on each side just to frame these windows. The same way over here, here, and here, and here, and here. Then in between, what I want to see is, you face the east, I want to see a new dawn rose growing here, and I want to see a new dawn rose growing here. And then in these beds, here's where you have an opportunity to really have some fun. You can fill behind the boxwood hedge here with all kinds of flowers. I would recommend some big groups of knockout roses here and here here and here. They're easy to take care of. And then a little bit in front of each window, just like that and that. And then fill in, Barbara, with all kinds of wonderful annuals and perennials, like those Camelot foxgloves or some of the Guardian delphiniums, which are fantastic and will give this such an English feel. You could even sow some poppies in there and larkspur and even some bachelor buttons. But you're going to have this framework, this formal evergreen framework, and then all of these flowers would work here in between. You could even put some kind of a gate here if you'd like, a picket gate. Beautiful house. I hope this helps. Carry on. I think you're going to have a beautiful landscape. <music> Now earlier in the show, we saw how I'd used lots of herbs and clustered them together at the entrance to the kitchen, which created a sense of entry there, and it's a perfect combination. Here, as we have a set of stairs going down into the fountain garden room, and then beyond into the orchard, we have a strong sense of entry. And here too, I've clustered containers, lots of spring blooming flowers, and just look at the kaleidoscope of color we've created here. I say that containers are probably the easiest way to create impact at any entrance. Just remember, entry is such an important garden home principle. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com.